I always used to see the future as devastation, and when it came, it melted into the ordinary present. I began to see that my fear was just a campaign to camouflage my relentless good fortune. What fabulous irony that just as I begin to lose my appetite for imagining catastrophe, catastrophe actually happens. No, don't let me in on this. Don't make me watch you grow up. No, no, everything is different. Things don't change, then change back. Whatever happens, I'm I'm to tell you the truth, I have barely begun to understand it. I'm writing, I'm living, I'm surviving. They're all good things, I suppose. If I could go back, I would go back. I don't. That's me assassinating Joanna Murray Smith, a wonderful Australian playwright who rather distinguishes herself by the rhythmic character of her monologues. I'm sorry, Joanna, your scripted rhythms are beautiful. And that rendition is sacrilege. But then for the same reasons, I think that similar apologies are owing to the Greek language for the regressive development of quantitative meter that accords rhythmical emphases to long syllables that have a more or less arbitrary relationship with the natural intonation of the words. My argument has been that the crime of torturing prose such as Murray Smith's so that it conforms to a dactylic beat while ignoring the natural pronunciation of the words is no worse than the misfortune that historical processes pressed upon Greek poetry between the archaic and classical periods and then defined quantitative metre from the Hellenistic to Roman periods. My theory, if you've followed this far, is that the bards of Homeric times chanted their rhapsodies to music, where the beat of the strummed instrument cued the emphasis irrespective of the natural intonation of the words. In music still today, it's no scandal if the beat doesn't align with the natural pronunciation. It all resolves happily in the art of song. The particular challenge for the pre-literary bard in the development of the Homeric corpus was to remember the narrative action and connect it with several formulae that lay to hand. And this creative act of memory by combining threads to form the stichoi had to be done on the spot under the superintendence of the lyre. Of course the words as conventionally accented didn't always fit, but the improvisatory impulse encouraged the bard to take advantage of long syllables, of which there was always a superabundance, to carry the musical beat. There was never an embarrassing moment in this pre-literary technique of recitation because it always enjoyed the rhythmical vouchsafe of music. The problem only arose some centuries later when the music stopped. That moment, which for convenience I'm identifying with writing from the archaic to classical period, meant that poetry had to stand on its own as an autonomous art, inspired as it were, by the internalized lyre of a cerebral, purely lexical Apollo. The words had to make their own rhythms. Ideally, poets would have started with a clean slate, which they did, but much later in the Byzantine period, when the changed symbolic order made the renovation possible. But ancient Greek poetry as a vehicle of sacred mythical narrative is nothing if not traditional, and the hallowed myths were received in the form that was known. Dactylic hexameter that seemed to flow somewhat inscrutably upon the longer syllables. The poetic art was predicated on this template, which was also the holy vector of the spiritual tradition. The stories that were known throughout the Greek-speaking Mediterranean owed their charisma to these extraordinary archaic tropes that spoke through distorted emphases. It became 
the way you conceive things poetically, and new poems were therefore also created on similar principles. In this advanced and ambitious literate period, the poetic art would acquire the two salient features that have tended to characterise versification ever since, or against whose structures poets have struggled. First, poetry would be archaic. It would hark back to an older idiom that didn't reflect the way that people spoke in town. Second, poetry and the criteria for excellence in poetry would become inaccessible, esoteric, obscure. You couldn't just sit down and write a poem the way you could write a dialogue or a history. It had to be fashioned in an artificial idiom on the metrical principle of distributing the beat among the abundance of long syllables or artificially elongated syllables, even though the words didn't want to receive them. It wouldn't be a democratic art but was distinguished as a gift of an elite who could manage the longs and the shorts in their unnatural rhythms that had little to do with the language that your mother spoke. A rhythm isn't formed by the way that words are usually pronounced, but rather a fabricated code that only specialised literateurs could unlock. No one quite knew why, nor how, nor by what reason. The voice, the poem, to voice the poem correctly, you had to fabricate a kind of non-accent to keep the words sounding a bit like the words you know. But at the same time, bump them into a spooky rhythm that they don't naturally carry. I can't think of a good analogy other than the visual word that I've been using here and there, which is grey to grey out the natural beat of the words so that they form a kind of sonic plasma through which you can run a different beat. I'm going to explore this idea of metrical grey in the last video. I think it's a necessary principle, but I'd rather illustrate it through our own language in order to understand it as a sensual and performative reality. I don't want to pretend that I've hit upon a radical new understanding of how Greeks of the post-archaic period reconciled two incompatible stress systems so that they didn't utterly confound performer and audience alike. They didn't talk about grey or even hint that some kind of plasmic elasticity was required that patches up the variance with the correct intonation of Greek. It's always just been handled as if there's our accentual poetry on the one hand and the much earlier quantitative metre on the other. Classical Greek poetry uses quantitative metre and the way that it removes itself from the ordinary patterns of speech proposes a heady rhythmic unity with music that we have difficulty imagining in modern languages. And so the prestige of the poetic form seems to win its glamour from a kind of inaccessibility. It's the cornerstone of a subsequent aesthetic of highly educated but somewhat uncritical snobs. Poetry must be very old in its structure, with unlikely rhythmic conventions drawn from archaic times, but for no apparent benefit other than conferring upon the lines a certain priestly authority, a specialness of stilted bard speak that carried the veneration of its hallowed stories from time immemorial. And so a third characteristic of poetry was born as a corollary of the second. Poetry is mystifying. Its aesthetic virtues appeal to criteria that no one can explain. It isn't just that the poem is admirably eloquent, that it uses clever words, that it has colourful analogies or contrasts or surprises, or that it imitates the sentiment here with languor or agitation or arousal or stateliness, all the good stuff of a solid and convincing exegesis. No, none of these concrete things of form and content reinforcing one another. Instead, from the ground up, the art of poetry was obscure in refusing the language that we're born with, 
because evidently it isn't good enough, even though the one that you're induced to write as a poet is ugly and dysfunctional. We'll all pretend that it's God-given, the only way to write poetry, poetry par excellence, just because its convention doesn't conform to common speech. In time, and this is where it becomes pernicious, this unnatural art of composition would attract aesthetic justifications. It wasn't merely an accident of history where a musical genre was stripped of its chant and was left in a condition of extreme oddness. That's my story, where the Greeks were left with the naked abstraction of words, but in the rhythm still installed by the music that had meanwhile retired from the performance. Instead of putting it down to a quirk of history in the formation of a new autonomous art, this bizarre pararhythm from the myth-making past was promoted as the very gold standard of versification. It presented a superior aesthetic order, even though anyone could have considered it inferior owing to its distance from natural language. And I've got to say that even in the later Byzantine period, when the quantitative system was eventually abandoned, no one actually accused or denounced the old ways. On the contrary, 19th century theorists remind us that the 12th century John Tzetzes, who wrote prolific accentual verse, meanwhile bemoaned the demise of quantitative metre. Quantitative metre just perished, without anyone identifying anything especially rotten in it. And the aesthetic justifications of this technical monstrosity still flourish today. If we click on the entry in Wikipedia for dactylic hexameter, we read, The Homeric poems arrange words so as to create an interplay between the metrical ictus, the first syllable of each foot, and the natural spoken accent of words. If the ictus and accent coincide too frequently, the hexameter becomes sing-songy. The gist of this explanation is that there would be something wrong with the meter where the stress coincided with the natural intonation of the words. So Dunn or Wordsworth or Rossetti would be sing-songy. News to us. She's with the lion deeply still in league and lulls him whilst she playeth on her back. Is Shakespeare's iambic pentameter sing-songy? Or if the coincidence of ictus and natural pronunciation is just a problem of dactylic hexameter, alas, poor Klopstock or Goethe, vieles wünscht sich der Mensch und doch bedarf er nur wenig. Denn die Tage sind kurz und beschränkt der sterblichen Schicksal. Is that sing-songy too? Well, evidently, it isn't only a problem in Greek, because according to Wikipedia, when we come to Latin, the same curse is invoked. Latin hexameters also plot a balance between an exaggerated emphasis, which would cause the verse to be sing-songy, and the need to provide some repeated rhythmic guide for skilled recitation. By the way, I love Wikipedia. This isn't to denounce the resource. On the contrary, it's of maximum value to establish what people really think on a widespread basis. For us, the lesson on offer through this most accessible portal is that, the po is that poetry shouldn't be obvious. Clear rhythms should be avoided or interspersed with clashes with natural speech. The ancient authors, so these suggestions, knew how to disrupt the overlap of the metre with word accent to avoid the pitfall of doggerel. Exactly when this specious argument arose, I cannot say. But it certainly goes back to the 19th century, as with Edvard Munch, who describes how verse rhythm may either be brought into harmony with the word rhythm, or both rhythms go along independently beside each other, 
The former, as the more natural and easy, is found in the rhythmical compositions of almost all nations of modern times. This harmony of both rhythmical systems is even necessary in languages where, as in German and English, the quantity of syllables, for the most part, depends on the accent. But then comes the value judgment. Okay? A more artistic management of the verse rhythm induced the Greeks to neglect the coincidence of the two systems. The mode in which the Greeks adapt the words to the verse rhythm is as follows. The natural rhythm of the words they leave entirely out of view. Interesting visual metaphor there. Leave entirely out of view, as if confessing that the poem is only for the eyes. But let's not get hung up on the metaphor. It's the core idea that somehow obscuring the natural rhythm of the words is a more artistic management of the verse rhythm. So it's more artistic to befuddle the reader. More artistic? Well, it's certainly more artificial. I guess that for anyone who's proud of being able to scan ancient meters, there's a beauty in the participatory wit of the reader to find the ictus. I see the artistic challenge, especially from the reader's perspective, but the idea that it forms a higher order of poetic attainment by riding roughshod over natural pronunciation is preposterous hyperbole. And insofar as this higher order is conflated from the confusion, it's destructive because students are taught to worship a vacuum and meanwhile scorn what's solid as if too much authenticity to the native tongue would be bad, as if simplicity would be in bad taste, as if infantile nursery rhymes. There are echoes of such contempt throughout the literature on Greek meter. For example, when Vilamovitz Möllendorf contemplates some lines of Synesios that are strongly bound in their almost ry rhyming rhythms, he dismissively describes how this ding-dong sound is a cling-clang intoxicated the listener, even though it might be disgusting for us. The pattern in the metrical literature is that anything simple is devalued, or as any complicated codes that are obscure and unwieldy are extolled as artistic. Behold the mystification that taints the Western poetic tradition. Basically, if you can understand it by the application of natural language and good rhythmical instinct, you're reading something lowbrow. Only if it's refined through exorbitant rules that have no basis in intuition can you ascend to the higher levels of art. Well, it isn't all a terrible story, because gratefully Dante and Dryden didn't bother about this snobbery and their cling-clang of accented metrics prevailed, even from Greek in the Byzantine period. That telling transition where the Greeks abandoned quantitative metre and adopted the accented metre that modern European languages also used until modernism is the subject for another video. Because the emancipation from quantitative metre sometimes left poets like John Tsetses confused, as if juggling a feeling of inferiority. And this feeling of inadequacy lingers. Compared to the incomparable artistic subtlety of the Greeks and Romans, our metrics are stuck in the medieval tradition of mere sing-song, which is an embarrassment that we surely want to trade out of as soon as we can. If taste skews the accentual system in this way, we have a vulnerable and fragile convention, and it's only a matter of time before it collapses. It's inherently weak because a doubt lies at its core that the metrical habit, beyond the unreachable quantitative meter of antiquity, that is, is silly and bubsy. 
This confusion in the poetic art lay like a dormant virus for centuries. While English poets made optimum use of simple iambic schemes, somewhat based on Italian hendecasyllables, often supplemented with equally clear and resonant rhymes. But the happy iambic edifice, often fortified with regular rhymes, was also de destined to tumble. Alas for the fateful quest for uh, the, 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 the fateful quest for a sustainable meter had been cruelled by classical incompatibilities from the outset.